um, known for founding the Stan Comedy Clubs in Edinburgh and Glasgow, which means that he'll be uh, very much at home here in the uh, Plaid Cymru Conference. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, now then, the interesting fact is that he used to be Assistant General Secretary for the Scottish Labour, though he left in 2003 and joined SNP in 2014 after a long period of contemplation, obviously. <laughs> and uh, he's now vice chair of the all-party parliamentary humanist group in 2017. It's always interesting to hear uh, the views from Scotland, um, which is slightly, very often seems slightly more exciting than politics back home here. So it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome Tommy Shepherd. Tommy Shepherd, over there. Thank you so much for the invitation to address your conference. Um, I want to try and bring you news from Scotland of the situation there politically and also to consider some of the things that are happening in the United Kingdom and give you a view of our uh, interest in that. Uh, this has been a very turbulent year politically uh, and still very hard to get traction on the slithering that's going on in British politics. Uh, but I do want to start by congratulating your party on its great achievement at the general election in increasing your Westminster representation by one third. That is, uh, <laughs> at, that I'm afraid... That, I'm afraid, is something that we didn't manage to do. It is worth saying, though, on June the 8th that the SNP won the general election in Scotland, because sometimes if you listen to our detractors or the media commentators, you would think that was not the case. In fact, the SNP has fought seven elections nationwide in the last six years, and it has come first in every single one of them. So we... <laughs> we don't... We don't take lessons from our detractors on who it represents the people of Scotland. But that said, we did have something of a wake-up call on June the 8th. Our vote slipped from 49% in 2015 to 38% uh, just this year. And that's a considerable loss of support in a relatively short period of time. And we don't take the view that this is just a matter of the pendulum swinging backwards and perhaps that is the natural state of affairs. We take the view that we are after every single vote in every single part of our country and we will not rest until we get those votes back that we didn't receive on June the 8th, 2017. And that means we have to look at why the situation arose. And I think there were many factors at play. There's lots of things go through people's minds as they make the journey to the uh, polling station and cast their ballot. But there are three main factors, I think, that affected the vote. And I should also say that all of the research seems to indicate not that people changed political allegiance from the SNP to other parties, but our biggest problem was that a lot of people, some half a million people who voted SNP in 2015, simply stayed at home. They did not feel sufficiently motivated or sufficiently focused in order to vote SNP this time. So why did this happen? Well, there are three reasons, I think, that interplayed. One, uh, one, of course, was Brexit, and it was rather bizarre, actually, for a general election campaign that was called ostensibly on the basis of Theresa May seeking a mandate for Brexit, that it was hardly discussed during the election at all, but that didn't really matter because we'd talked of little else for the previous two years, so clearly it bore very heavily on people's uh, minds when they were making up their opinions. And the SNP, unashamedly, is probably the most pro-European party uh, in Scotland, if not in the United Kingdom, uh, perhaps along with your, yourselves. And we unashamedly campaigned for a Remain vote in the Brexit referendum, and we were therefore identified very much as being an anti-Brexit party. And there is a political consequence to that. It means that people who are minded to support independence, but who for one reason or another 
have an antipathy towards the European Union, decided that they wouldn't vote SNP because they did not want their vote to be taken as a mandate to frustrate the process of Brexit. And that is something that we understand and we, we have to accommodate. Uh, the second thing was the Conservative campaign, which in fairness to them was a very effective campaign on the question of the second Scottish independence referendum. Now, it has to be said that the whole purpose of the Tory campaign was not to persuade people who support independence to stop doing so. The entire strategy of the Tories was focused within the 55% of the population that had rejected independence in 2014. They wished to position the Conservative Party as the principal voice of unionism in Scotland, and that was what they fought their campaign on ruthlessly. In fact, it was laughable the extent to which they tried to distance themselves from the Conservative leadership in London, even refusing to use the word Conservative on many of their candidates' leaflets. They positioned themselves as the Scottish Unionist Party, and they appealed to Liberal Democrat and Labour voters to come and support them in this occasion to reject uh, the SNP's desire to have a second referendum on the question of Scottish independence. And they were successful in that. There is evidence, for example, that many Labour voters, particularly older Labour voters, perhaps on the right of the political spectrum, not connected to social media, that they took that message and they decided to hold their nose and vote Conservative on this occasion because their unionism was more important to them than any concept of social or economic reform, which might have been the reason why they voted Labour. Now, of course, the Tory campaign was quite pernicious. They were trying to suggest that by suggesting there should be a second referendum, somehow we refuse to accept the result of the first one. And that is not true. We do accept the result of the 2014 referendum. We do accept that on that occasion, people in Scotland voted to stay within the United Kingdom. But we say that if circumstances change to such an extent that it invalidates the choices that were there in 2014, then people should have the opportunity to have a revote. In the same way, if you buy something in a shop and you get it home and it's not as described, you have the right to take it back and get your money back. Well, so with independence, people have the right to get their vote back if the people who won that referendum change the goalposts after the event. And one of the biggest changes that could happen would be Scotland being taken out of the European Union against its will. Now, that wasn't just an abstract theory. That was something we wrote down and put in our manifesto in 2016 for the Scottish general election, an election which we won. And that is the position of a majority of members of our national parliament in Holyrood. So this isn't an abstract thing. And it says only that in certain circumstances there would be a second referendum. But of course, that wasn't the way it was portrayed by the Tories. And we understand the confusion and the uncertainty that many people feel in these difficult times. And that's why, in response to that, we have listened to that result. And we have said that the mandate still stands, but we will not decide whether or not to execute it until we are much clearer about what the process of Brexit actually means. And I'll come to Brexit in a minute. And the third um, thing that was at play, undoubtedly, was what you might call the Corbyn factor. We had been remarkably successful in 2015 in achieving a phenomenal shift of support from the Labour Party to the SNP, in part because of the legacy of 13 years of the Blair government and their foreign wars and their cuts and their PFI and many other things, but principally because of a strategic mistake by the Labour Party in Scotland to join a political alliance with the Conservatives to fight against Scottish independence in the 2012-2014 period. We were able, with some legitimacy, to tag them as the Red Tories, and people resonated to that, and that's why they came over to us in phenomenal numbers. Now, you can say what you want about Jeremy Corbyn, and I've said many things, but the phrase Red Tory doesn't really stick with him. And therefore, we were facing a new opponent in the Labour Party, and I don't, and, and I don't think we quite understood until the election was approaching its later stages that in fact this was a serious political threat. In fact, if you recall, when Theresa May called the election seven weeks out from polling day, everyone assumed that Labour was just going to be laughed out of the park. It didn't turn out that way and we need to adjust to that situation. So there were many people, many people, some of them have come up to me afterwards and said so, 
who were caught up with this Corbyn surge. And they saw the way he was being attacked and vilified in the media, exactly in the same terms as we are attacked and vilified in the same media. And they saw the explosion of interest in social media, and they thought, you know what, we're having some of this, we're going to join this bandwagon. This is exciting. This is something they wanted to be part of. And many of these people are exactly the same people who voted yes in 2014 and who voted for me in 2015. And they came up to me afterwards and they said, well, we thought we should give Jeremy a chance. Now, we need to respond to that. So what would, what would be our response to the Scottish Labour Party? Well, the first thing is to say that there's a very big irony going on here because I don't know what the situation is here, but I guess there may be parallels. But the Labour Party in Scotland is run by people who wouldn't pass the time of day normally with Jeremy Corbyn. They, in fact... People like Ian Murray and Kezia Dugdale campaigned in quite vile terms against Corbyn becoming leader of the Labour Party. And they sat in the House of Commons shouting and jeering at him from behind him to try and undermine his presence for the first year of his premiership. So you can't actually say that the Scottish Labour Party is in any sense run by the Corbynistas. And there is a big dysfunction there. I mean, obviously, they're all Corbynistas now because nothing... Uh, <laughs> Nothing smells as sweet as success, and it was ironic to see Ian Murray MP leading a standing ovation for Jeremy Corbyn when he came into the House of Commons. But that will pass, and there is a big fundamental problem here, and that is that many of the people who voted Labour in this election this year, who had voted for independence, they've not changed their mind on the question of independence. That's still something they believe in, and in fact, the Labour vote in this election probably had a greater number of people who support the concept of Scottish independence than ever before. So it will be interesting to see how the Labour Party deals with that question, whether or not they will allow an open debate within their ranks about constitutional options, or whether they will try and close it down and exclude people from the party, as they did last time, <coughs> to advocate a position of Scottish independence. We'll see. The omens at the minute don't look very good. We have a contest for the Labour Party leadership in Scotland uh, being run by two people uh, who are engaged in a race, really, to see who can be the most unionist. And what that means is to see who can be the most strident defender of the British state. A sad and sorry state of affairs indeed. So Labour doesn't appear to be responding. But I think we need to respond to Corbyn in three ways. The first is, I think we need to say, and this is for the SNP, that we will work with them where we can. You know, where we share objectives, there is no point trying to manufacture differences where they don't exist. And it is interesting to see that many of the policies that Corbyn advocates, most notably on free education, are already the practice in Scotland of the policies that have been implemented by the SNP Scottish Government. So we will do that if we can. The second thing we will do is actually point out that the Labour Manifesto, whilst it was probably better than the Tory Manifesto, was still inadequate in many ways. They were pledging to restore about half of the welfare cuts on the poor that the Tory had brought in since, uh, since 2000. About half. We were pledging to restore all of them. They said nothing whatsoever about electoral or constitutional reform, and Labour looks completely unable to change our voting system, to abolish the House of Lords, or in any other way to modernise the British Constitution. And most of all, perhaps, they are still a party that believes in diverting more than £200 billion from social welfare programmes to spend on a new generation of weapons of mass destruction which put the entire world at risk. So what I'm saying to you is that Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party isn't half as radical as people think it is. And we will take, you know, we will not stop in order to point those inadequacies out. Uh, the third thing to say about Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party is it didn't win. You know, and this is despite the fact that you could not have had a more inept Tory campaign. It, they were imploding all over the place, and there was a phenomenal amount of goodwill. A lot of people tactically voting, holding their nose and saying, oh, well, we'll just, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll go for Labour this time. In spite of all of that, they still didn't win. And not only did they not just win by a little bit, they didn't win by a country mile. Labour is nowhere near forming a majority within the United Kingdom Parliament. So, 
in many sense, the argument has to be, well, you might be seduced and, and attracted by some of these statements, but actually, there is, no gar there, there is no substitute at the end of the day for simply taking political control of your own country, because that way, you can guarantee that you will get the changes that you want and you're not dependent on somebody else. At the risk of running over time, I wanted just to talk about two other aspects of our dialogue with the uh, with the Labour Party. Um, one is the, um, the question of solidarity. I am sick and tired of hearing Labour politicians try and attack us because they say, well, the working class in Glasgow have got more in common with the working class in Liverpool and Swansea than they have with the ruling class in either country. Therefore, you know, you guys are out of order. I mean, that is just such a glib truism that it's hardly worth stating. Of course, working class people in the great cities of the United Kingdom have more in common with each other, but they also have more in common with the working class in Marseille, in Milan, in Detroit, and every other part of the world than they do with the people who run the British state. And to try and pretend, to try and pretend as some Labour MPs do, that the only way you can achieve solidarity and social change is by maintaining the current constitutional settlement of the United Kingdom, is to say that the current settlement offers the best possible framework for the demonstration and execution of that solidarity. And our basic contention is that if ever that were true, it most certainly is not true now. In fact, the opposite is in place. My country and the people of my country are being held back from having progressive social and economic change because they are attached to a much larger country and because there is an insistence that change can only happen at the pace of those who want it the slowest, and only if we get the consent of a conservative majority in England. And people are fed up with that. And that is why we say we want our independence, we want self-government, in order to demonstrate solidarity with the rest of Britain and the rest of the world. We want to be able to engage rather than being held back. And that is at the principle of our message on independence. Um, I wanted also to talk about nationalism. Because I am sick to the back teeth of Labour MPs, left-leaning commentators in The Guardian, who use the word nationalism as if it were a swear word. And what they try to do is to suggest that the SNP and Plaid Cymru are in some way akin to the xenophobic right-wing anti-immigrant parties of Western Europe. And you and I know that nothing could be further from the truth. Our nationalism, actually, when you scratch the surface, is about the people. Not about, for me, a wee bit hill and glen. It's not about the short bread tin images of Scotland. It's about the people who live in that country and their right to determine their own future. There's therefore... <laughs> our... <laughs> and therefore, our nationalism is a contemporary and progressive force for political change. And to try and associate it with the right-wing xenophobes of Western Europe is not only intellectually bankrupt, it is a slur, and we should call out the likes of Owen Jones and others every time they try and do it. The final point I wanted to make is, is regarding Brexit, because this is something which conditions, really, the field in which we operate politically and the options that we will have going forward. And... The first thing to say, I know that Wales voted differently from Scotland in this, but there are many people from Theresa May down who say, oh, if you give us an argument about what's happening here, then you don't respect the will of the people. You don't respect the decision that was taken in June 2016 when we voted to leave the European Union. And that, same as the reaction to the 2014 result, that is nonsense. Of course we respect the result of that <coughs> referendum. But some things have to be entered as caveats to that. The first is this, that in the entire course of British political history, this must be the most deceitful and mendacious campaign that has ever been fought. It was based completely <laughs> on lies. And I don't mean, I don't just mean the obvious lie that you'll get 350 million pounds a week more for the NHS if you vote to leave. I mean the lie that said, you don't have any sovereignty at the minute. You don't have the right to determine your own future. 
whilst people were in the middle of exercising their own sovereignty. I mean, it was just such a fabrication that I think, actually, the more this unravels, you have to call into account the validity of the result if it was based on that prospectus, which is why more and more people are now saying they regret the decision that they took. But the other thing is this. People have the right to change their mind. If you decide on a particular course of action and you then see the consequences of it and they are not desirable, of course you can do something different. In fact, it is a sign of intelligence in an organism that it is able to adapt its behaviour to changing circumstances. So to just continue blindly over the cliff, no matter what's happening, seems to me to be a truly ridiculous proposition. Um, the other thing is, that we have to be very clear on this, that the political right in this country do not have the right to say that that was a mandate for things that were not on the ballot paper. Yes, people may have voted to leave the EU, but they didn't vote for a collapse in all trading relationships with the European Union. They didn't vote to expel other European citizens who live in our country. They didn't vote for a collapse of the British economy and the pound and mass unemployment. And it is not acceptable to say that as a consequence of the vote that you took, you have to lap up and accept these things. And we will not do it. And we will continue our argument. And we are working with the Welsh Government as best we can on this. And we will say that if we are unable, unable to achieve a situation where the government thinks again and retains the single market and keeps us in a trading relationship with Europe, then we will not give consent to the Brexit bill in our own national parliament. And that will create a new constitutional crisis that will mean that the government in Westminster will have to override against all convention the decisions of our national devolved parliaments. And as that situation develops, I think even more and more will happen that people will become aware and terrified of. And even more, the case will be built to say, stop before this is too late, pull back from the brink. But I tell you this, and I shall finish with this, that if they don't do that, then we absolutely reserve the right to consult the Scottish people on their own future again. Because we are not going to see our people being driven over this Brexit cliff with all of the consequences that that entails without them having the right to say, no, I don't want this as I didn't want it last time. And we will now take the decision to take control of our own future and to take back control from the Tory party and determine the future of Scotland ourselves. That remains on the agenda. It is only a matter of when we choose to execute that mandate and we will do it the next time at a time when we will be confident of victory. And I can assure you that whether that happens in 2019 or 2022, it is coming. This isn't over, and next time we shall vote for our own independence. Thank you.